Hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. So it is official, guys. Esther Purse has officially come out and outlines problems with the SEC's Howey test. Michael Branch posting this. So SEC Commissioner Hester Peirce outlines problems with the SEC's Howey test. Here's what she said, all right? The test stems from the landmark Supreme Court case decided in 1946, establishing criteria which a financial agreement qualifies as an investment contract and is therefore subject to federal securities laws. As it relates to crypto, Purse described why the test is so significant for the industry. And guys, here's what she goes on to say. She says, there has been a lot of emphasis on the Howey test in crypto um, because a lot of these things were sold as tokens, plus a promise that we're going to build a network. So um, she mentioned this on a podcast she recently did. Gensler says proof of stake assets could be security. So the court case that had led to the creation of the Howey test centered on the sale of units of uh, Florida-based Citrus Grove, as we all know, uh, the Orange Grove argument. It determined an investment contract is a contract transaction or scheme whereby a person invests his money in a common enterprise. So I don't have to go over that. I I think uh, all of us in the XRP community likely know that already. Of course, in August, Gary Gensler did say many tokens may be unregistered securities because folks buying these tokens are anticipating profits and there's a small group of entrepreneurs and technologists standing up and nurturing these projects. Hester Peirce argues, though, that the existence of an investment contract doesn't just center on the asset, but also the promises that are attached to it. She put forth the opinion that these two components are separate from each other. So... There's the one thing, right, the expecting, uh, the expectation of profit, but then there's that other thing that we just don't actually have in a lot of the crypto space. There are promises, uh, explicit promises that are written out in the contract that uh, the issuer would promise to the investor. And so, I mean, Ripple has never done this for investors. They have never said, well, if you buy the XRP token, we are definitely going to do X, Y, and Z for you in order to make the XRP token uh, rise in price. We are just, I mean, we're, we're doing our own research and we are, we can speculate based on what Ripple is doing, based on the partnerships that Ripple has and that they've been forging over the last several years. We can, um, I mean, we can kind of glean why we want to invest in XRP and a handful of other cryptocurrencies for that matter. And Purse is pointing out the same, whether or not a crypto asset itself is a security is something that isn't addressed by Howie. She goes on to say, you can say, well, look, uh, a lot of these initial sales sure look like securities offerings. But then the question is, is that token, is the crypto itself a security? She asked. That's a much harder question to answer. And I think it's one that people answer differently. The agency's reliance on the Howey test is also somewhat flawed, said Purse, because of the interpretation's apparent permanence. In 2018, the SEC director of the Division of Corporate Finance, William Hinman, said he believed Bitcoin and Ethereum are not securities. So... Uh, again, I don't want to touch on the William Hinman thing because I think we've gone through that quite a bit. At the end of the day, though, Hester Peirce wants a change. Since Peirce joined the SEC in 2018, she said there's been no real positive movement on crypto regulation despite a lot of conversations and efforts to better understand the technology, describing the lack of progress as frustrating. She also said the inaction of government is impacting the way people operate in the crypto space. Guys, here's another quote from Hester Purr. She says, the wheels of regulation and legislation move very slowly. And I think that that can both be a good and bad thing. She said, in the crypto world, we've seen for a long time that there's been a lack of clarity, which I think has led to people to do things that they wouldn't have done had there been clear guidelines. Purse explains she wasn't specifically thinking about crypto when she became part of the SEC, but gradually gravitated towards the technology as part of a focus on how the SEC was facilitating or inhibiting innovation. Uh, she says, I think it's great that people are challenging the way we've done things. Sometimes those challenges are going to fall flat and sometimes they're going to succeed. But we just need to make sure that it's not regulation that's picking winners and losers. It's people who are picking winners and losers. Many in the XRP community have been fairly critical of Hester Purse, and I can see why. On the other hand, though... Um, I get her point. I get that her hands are tied to a degree. I mean, she's got other commissioners there, and I'm sure they have a mechanism over there on, uh, you know, and they vote on if uh, certain rules are going to go through or not. So, I mean, she's not a lone wolf. She doesn't make all the decisions herself. What she's outlining here, though, uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, but, but as I was saying, people are critical because, you know, she talks a big game, but there is never any action. And I think 
uh, in the XRP community. We've been noticing this, and uh, you know, a lot of us were seeing Hester Peirce as a very favorable person within the SEC. But as months and years went on, and we were continuing to see no progress. A lot of us were getting frustrated with Hester Purse and what she says when we don't see any results, when we don't see any action. But, uh, you know, it is a tough process. Obviously, when you work with dinks like Gary Gensler, how can you really expect things to get done in an efficient way? Anyway, gonna keep moving. Saw this and uh, it's a little alarming. Here, let me explain this to you guys. XRP Crypto Wolf posted this. Uh, now U.S. senators are coming out and saying banning crypto might be an option. Now, I don't know how they're going to do this. This was coming from Senator Sherrod Brown, uh, head of the Senate Committee on Banking, Housing and Urban Affairs. He said that banning cryptocurrencies might be on the table. However, he acknowledged that completely prohibiting cryptocurrencies would be challenging. Maybe banning it, although banning is a very difficult thing because it will go offshore. And who knows how that will work? So he clearly didn't think this thing through too clearly. Uh, the, uh, the Ohio senator has stressed that crypto is a threat to national security. So... Again, Democratic senator, not that that should make a difference, but is he jumping on a particular narrative, perhaps one that the Democrats were trying to instill uh, with, for example, maybe, maybe, not saying for sure, but maybe the FTX collapse. In late November, Brown urged Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen to help rein in crypto companies following the implosion of the FTX exchange that sent shockwaves across the cryptocurrency industry and beyond uh, back in 2014. Uh, Senator Joe Manchin wrote a letter to federal uh, regulators demanding a blanket Bitcoin ban following the collapse of Mt. Gox. So this narrative has been coming back time and time again. Every time there is uh, something critical, a crisis in quotes in the crypto space, uh, you know, all these regulators want to rush to push in crypto regulation and they want it to be harsh. They don't want it to be easy for you and I to purchase cryptocurrency and they have all the reasons to do that and I think we're seeing that again and this is why we're seeing senators like Sherrod Brown parroting the same kind of sentiment. However, even harsh cryptocurrency critics admit that the industry has now become too powerful. So this is the, uh, the, the other part of the story that I think makes it very interesting. Crypto has evolved and now more than ever are retail investors highly educated in crypto, uh, crypto investing, uh, you know, crypto adoption and uh, how cryptocurrencies are going to change the world. Now, maybe I'm speaking kind of in a little bubble because I do this channel and I know I communicate with a lot of you guys uh, interested in the real world utility, of course, of cryptos like XRP and Algorand and XLM and whatever other cryptocurrencies provide value to the ecosystem. There is also, of course, a large facet of people who just jump on the hype bandwagon. And uh, obviously that is still the majority. Um, so, you know, but, but this group is getting larger. I think, uh, you know, in the XRP community, this, this group has certainly grown over the last five years. People come and go, but I think overall we have seen, uh, an increase in the amount of people who are knowledgeable about crypto, who want to invest more, who see the possibilities and are taking, you know, opportunities like this when we're in a down market, we are down roughly, as of today, we are down roughly 74%, 75% give or take. So, you know, we're taking these opportunities to really accumulate the cryptocurrencies, the good projects that will solve problems. Yet we have guys like this, yes, in the United States that still want to stifle uh, the innovation. So I think he's just kind of taking that trajectory, that narrative, the mainstream narrative that they are putting out there. Luckily for us guys, other countries around the world are becoming more and more favorable to cryptocurrencies. I saw this from Michael Branch on Twitter. Nigeria set to pass bill recognizing Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. So they're passing a bill recognizing Bitcoin specifically and a lot of other cryptos, likely cryptocurrencies that are going to be part of, uh, well, the new financial system, likely uh, blockchain tracking uh, for, uh, you know, other purposes as well, supply chain management. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why you would use uh, DLT technology, blockchain technology, and cryptocurrencies. So the news report by Nigerian-based Mathad Punch Newspapers on December the 18th, following an interview with House of Representatives Committee on Capital Markets Chairman Babangilda Ibram, uh, the report stated that if the Investment and Securities Act of 2007, the amendment bill is signed into law, it would allow the local Securities and Exchange Commission to recognize cryptocurrency and other digital funds as capital for investment. Uh, Ibrahim stressed the need for Nigeria to keep up to date with trends and developments in capital markets. Uh, here's what he said. Like I said earlier, during the second reading, we need an efficient and vibrant capital market in Nigeria. For us to do that, we have to be up to date with global practices. And I mean, I got to say, I got to point out the obvious here. There are countries like the United States. They are, you know, taking a look at crypto, the crypto market, and they see a certain set of problems. But then you've got countries like Nigeria 
who are in a very, very different situation financially, socially, politically. Uh, and so, you know, the need for cryptocurrency in these developing nations, I think, is a bigger issue, a more serious issue. And, uh, you know, these countries are understanding, uh, you know, I guess doing a cost benefit analysis, weighing the pros and cons of cryptocurrency adoption and realize, no, this would be way better for our country for, you know, all those reasons rather than not implementing cryptocurrency. And, uh, you know, as I've called it in the past, when you have everything and you are faced with a problem, it's what I like to call a princess problem. So, you know, the United States dealing with crypto in a way that's very, very different than uh, many other countries around the world. And so, uh, you know, we're seeing it here in Nigeria. I feel like at the end of the day, though, if enough countries jump on board with crypto adoption and we start to see it become normalized uh, in society, the United States will have no choice. And I feel like it's already getting to that point. So great news here uh, from Michael Branch. Great news here coming out of Nigeria, an African country. And we know Ripple is also uh, permeating Africa one company at a time. I also saw this, guys, from Real XRP Boy here on Twitter. Okay, he dug up this old Quora exchange, this old Quora response uh, from David Schwartz. He posted about two years ago, since XRP is working alongside the established financial system, is it plausible that the U.S. Federal Reserve may take ownership of XRP in the Ripple network, becoming XRP a kind of digital USD? So more talk about the Fed, you know, taking over the XRP ledger, taking over, or rather taking possession of the XRP, going back to this whole buyback uh, possibility, this buyback scenario. David Schwartz responded here, okay, they could take possession of Ripple's private network, but there's really no way they could take possession of XRP or the XRP ledger. It's a public resource operated by people all over the globe. They could create their own copy of the system, just as they could with any other public ledger system, but they'd have to compete with systems like Bitcoin and the XRP ledger. If the value of these systems comes from their decentralization, then why would people want to use the one owned by the Federal Reserve? The design of public blockchain systems makes a lot of engineering sacrifices precisely to ensure that they can't be taken over or censored. They have no administration functions. It wouldn't make sense to take over an existing system and completely destroy its value proposition. So, I mean, it's almost sounding like he was foreshadowing something, although this was only two years ago. And what I'm going to show you next actually happened before that. Okay, XRP underscore Crow uh, posted this, and uh, this was a quote from Matt Hamilton, apparently, and it was just posted on December the 16th. Do you think a copycat XRP ledger has been tried by the large banks? And Matt Hamilton actually responded, Swift did attempt to do something like that. It was using Hyperledger, IIRC, but their main takeaway was this doesn't work without a public token. So that sounds to me that Swift needed an XRP ledger. They realized they had to have an XRP-like cryptocurrency in order to be as efficient as Ripple was with doing what Ripple was doing, which was basically competing with them. So in fact, they did create a copycat XRP ledger. Matt Hamilton has now confirmed this. XRP Darren down here saying, Matt, where did you find this information? Was it public? And Matt did respond. Uh, so this is further down in the thread here. Matt did respond. Sorry, it was Hyperledger, not Corda. And then he posted uh, the link here. Download the report and read around page 24 and liquidity. In short, they replicated Nostro and Vostro and found limited savings. So guys, this is a report back from March of 2018. Swift completes landmark DLT proof of concept. So they did in fact copy Ripple. They created a copycat ledger, a copycat to the XRPL. Uh, they completed their blockchain proof of concept to address Nostro accounts and reconciliation issues. Uh, down here, do we have the report down here? Uh, proof of concept went extremely well, proving the fantastic progress that has been made with DLT and the Hyperledger Fabric 1.0 in particular. Uh, where is that? Uh, okay. So there's a lot down here. I don't know. I don't see any pages. He did say page 24. Although the proof of concept demonstrated DLT could improve Nostro liquidity management and reconciliation processes. It also revealed that the prerequisites will have to be met before banks can enjoy the full benefits of switching to a DLT process. Uh, on a positive note, according to the report, Swift can help facilitate the necessary improvements in the Nostro processing by helping its community migrate towards real-time liquidity reporting and processing through Swift GPI. Also, the report notes that unique identification of each entry is the cornerstone of any liquidity and reconciliation solution. Uh, the reuse of the GPI unique end-to-end -end transaction reference, leveraging Swift's central payments tracker for the purpose, is an obvious choice. Uh, I don't see where the report is. Oh, it's down here. Okay, so you guys can uh, download this report. It will be linked in this uh, in this link right at the bottom down here. Uh, and here it is, guys, the PDF. Let's go to page 24 and see uh, what they say down here about liquidity. 
Right, it's just down here. The value of a DLT solution will depend on banks' liquidity management capabilities, level of automation and centralization. The value proposition will depend on the bank's settlement model uh, for their key currencies, their individual existing model to access intraday liquidity data, and their level of internal liquidity monitoring and management process automation. So it sounds as though they were having a problem with liquidity, and uh, it sounds as though, as per Matt Hamilton down here, they couldn't really do it. They found limited savings if they did not produce a token that could function as that liquidity transfer, i.e. the XRP token. Interesting to note here, also Bob Way did chime in on this thread. GPII was Swift's response to Ripple pitching banks. It was partially my fault because I spent a lot of time talking to Wim and Gottfried at the Bitcoin Amsterdam conference explaining how the XRP ledger worked and how banks can integrate with it. Seems I did a good job in getting them to understand because not too long afterwards they had copied our entire pitch almost slide for slide and diagram for diagram. So in fact they did create a copycat based on the RippleNet model. Uh, but GPII wasn't new technology at all. It was merely an improved service level agreement. The SLA said in effect, participating banks agree to process incoming SWIFT messages faster, but it didn't give away any new technology to make that happen. And so I guess this is why Brad Garlinghouse kept calling SWIFT's GPI a Ferrari body on an old Model T Ford engine. Uh, banks had to update their own internal processes to speed them up. So there you have it, guys. SWIFT did in fact copy ripple basically realized that the xrp cryptocurrency was central and they just could not get around that i don't know if you guys remember that bearable guy meme where uh it's the guy uh, you know deciding which button to push uh do i join ripple or do i use a competitor and use something like i think it was r3 that is going to settle in xrp anyway i feel like this is the predicament that swift eventually found themselves in and now this is why Swift will likely implement RippleNet, as they are now realizing the XRP token is central to the value of the network. That's just my opinion, but I want to hear what you guys think. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video if you like the content I'm providing. I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.